What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Iconic Show. It's your host, Inam Khan. I'm actually very excited about this week's video. Originally, I had a different idea in mind, but over the weekend, I gave a seminar to about 100 people on the basics of stock investing for beginners, along with tips and common mistakes that many beginner traders make so that you can become a profitable trader as soon as possible. And you, so you don't make the same mistakes I made. Along with that, I went over financial planning tips for your 20s and 30s. And of course, I went over whether or not you should buy Tesla and Bitcoin. So luckily, this presentation was recorded. So I figured why not share it with all of you guys? I think you guys would be extremely interested in that. But before we get into that, I wanted to remind you guys to get your four free stocks when you deposit $100 in Webull. Make sure to press the like button on this video and subscribe to my channel. I need about six more subscribers until I hit 1,000 subs. So without further ado, I really hope you guys enjoy this presentation. So um, here are a few things that I wanted to go over today. We'll try to get through everything uh, if we have time. So first is go over Robinhood investing. That's what I use. And I want to go over the techniques that have helped me a lot. Um, I think investing in and of itself and trading stocks is a journey and it takes time to become profitable. Most people are not profitable right off the bat. So I wanted to go over different strategies, tips for beginners, common mistakes that I've seen many people make, including myself, uh, different platforms that you can use. And of course, uh, one of the big hot topics, Bitcoin slash Tesla, that's always all over the news, especially uh, Bitcoin lately. Uh, my predictions for 2021 and what I think is going to happen. So once we get past the Robinhood investing um, portion of this presentation, I did want to go over some financial goals that I believe are important to achieve in your 20s and 30s. It will um, change the trajectory of your life and can make a dramatic difference in your life moving forward. And then we'll end with a conclusion. And of course, guys, I want to keep this very casual. So if you guys have any questions, you know, we'll, we'll ha we have a Q&A discussion at the end. Um, just let me know and I'll try to do my best to answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, Robinhood investing. Uh, I do have to, of course, make the disclaimer that I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just here to help you um, become profitable in your journey of investing and trading. And I want to give you guys tips that have helped me become profitable. All right, so let's start off with the beginning. So trading and investing, those are the two main, main ways to accumulate wealth in the stock market. So trading is a lot more based off of technicals and indicators, and you use something called price action in stocks, okay? How the stock moves and the volume, how many people are buying and selling. And so a few different types of trading are scalping, which people buy a stock and they sell it within a few minutes. This is actually very common. I've seen many people do this and very risky as well. There's also day trading, which many of you guys I'm sure have heard of, which is where you buy a stock and you sell it within that same day. And then there's swing trading, which you buy a stock, you hold on to it for a few days to a few weeks, and then you sell it. So these are just three different ways of trading stocks. I personally, um, I have tried day trading, I've tried scalping, and I've tried swing trading. I've tried all three. The one that ended up working for me best was swing trading. And I'm gonna get into more, I'm gonna get more into that later on in this presentation. And then of course, there is the investor route in terms of the um, in terms of the stock market and where you buy stocks that you actually believe in. You're not here for, to play around with the volatility and make money off of the price pattern of the stock. You're here for the long term, right? These are the guys who get into companies like Facebook, Tesla, and they're buying and then they're not buying to sell short term. They're buying to be in it for the long term. Even like Microsoft is a great company as well. So a lot of times this is done off of financial analysis and financial valuation. So one of the biggest tips I can give to beginners is you need to fix your mindset right before you get into the stock market. Now, many people, when they think of the stock market, they think of a get rich quick scheme. They've heard so many people make money, become millionaires in the stock market overnight, and they think they can go and do the same thing. Well, I wanted to give you guys the 90-90-90 rule, which some of you might have heard of. I'm not sure. So basically what this rule says is that 90% of traders lose 90% of their portfolio in 90 days or less. 
they come in thinking, oh, you know, I can I can make money in here. I've seen so many people do it. They put all their money into one stock that they think is going to blow up overnight. It burns it. They burn their whole account. They give up. They think, hey, this is not for me. It's all fake. It's a scam. It's a sham. This is just bootleg. And that's not the case. You can't go into stock trading like it's a get rich quick scheme. On the other hand, if you treat it like any other business or skill, you invest the time to learn everything and you invest the time to try it out and improve every single day. I promise that you will become better and you will become profitable. And once you're profitable, it's a wrap from there because from there on out, all you need is just capital, okay? Your portfolio should be a steady increase and not a choppy, you know, one day you're at an all time high, next day you're almost zero and then third day you're up again. This is not how a portfolio should be. It's something that should be increasing steadily over time. And you need to have a bit of an abundance mindset. Um, I've seen this many times with people where they would be in a trade and they sell a stock and then that stock ends up going up and they regret it for weeks. They're like, oh my God, I could have made so much money if I just held on. Um, I wish I didn't do that. And that type of mindset will hold you back in the long run because it's going to affect your future trading. What everyone needs to realize is that there are a million different ways people are making money in the stock market. And I'm not even exaggerating. There are a million different ways. People are day trading, swing trading, um, scalping, tech stocks. Uh, they're doing this to biomedical stocks, pharmaceutical stocks. They're playing earnings. There are literally a million different ways to make money in the stock market. You just need to find your edge. That's what it's called in, I guess, uh, stock market language, your edge. You need to find out what works for you. And it's different for everyone else. I can tell you guys exactly what I do. But at the end of the day, it will not be useful for you until you, you know, dip your feet in the water and you go into the stock market and you try to learn yourself and find a pattern and see what works for you. Okay. All I can do is hold your hand and try to teach you as much as I can, as much as I've learned. And you need to take steps to figure it out on your own. Okay. So one of the um, tips that has helped me a lot is I follow in terms of swing trading. Again, I want to reiterate, this is for swing trading. This is what has worked for me and it's helped me become quite profitable. So in swing trading, I stick to the same stocks. Okay. I stick to big tech. This is your, you know, Microsoft, Facebook. Um, this is Tesla. It's all the EV companies. I stick to EV and tech companies and I, they they have to be large market cap, which means they're usually big companies. They're dependable. They have a proven track record. They usually have over $10 billion um, market value. And there's a decent amount of volatility in the stock price. Again, as traders, we make money on the ups and downs of these stock prices. Okay. So the quote I like using all the time is choose a few stocks and stick to them like glue. I follow maybe 10 or 15 stocks. That's it. And I have friends day in and day out. I follow the news day in and day out and what can affect their prices. And when you do this for a while, what you're going to see is over time, you start to build an intuition um, on, on a few select stocks. And you learn that, hey, under this price, this stock's really looking underpriced um, or at this price, it's very overpriced. And you get a better idea of when to buy and sell these stocks. Like, hey, this stock's gone up like 20% in a day, which is a lot for the stock. It's getting a bit risky holding on to this stock. So I'm going to take profits a little bit. All right. So that's my, that's my technique. And this has worked very well for me. I follow a few stocks. And also I want to point out that when you go out of your way um, to let's say randomly, hey, you saw some big mover on Robinhood and this stock's moving like 30%. When you try to FOMO into the stock and FOMO for that, those that don't know is the fear of missing out. It's just, you wanna get in because you hear everyone else is in there. When you FOMO into a stock that's already moved 20, 30%, there's already people in that stock that know this stock way better than you do because they focus primarily on that stock and they're gonna beat you and they're gonna burn your account, right? You don't want that to happen. Just it's at, in your advantage to stick to the same stocks and just follow them. Okay. And again, for me, what has helped a lot is big tech and EV. So big tech, um, I can share my list of stocks. If you guys request it, I can always share the list of stocks that I follow. And then EV are just the big companies like Tesla, Neo. Um, we got Plug Power, which has been a crazy one in the past month. 
So these are the stocks I like to follow. So my next tip for beginners is to buy the dip. So buy the dip basically means when stocks go down, when the market is down, you make it a habit psychologically to buy. What, what I've seen happen many, many times is that people will buy a stock and then the price goes up and they're happy, their portfolio is green. But then when it starts to go down, you're sad and it starts going down really fast and you panic sell. And that's literally the worst thing you can do, okay? And actually on the contrary, you see a stock that's go, that you've been following for a while and you thought about buying, but you didn't buy and you see it going higher and higher every single day. And then you see it at like an all time high and then boom, you wanna go ahead and buy it. Literally the worst time to buy, okay? So what you should be doing is if you see a stock that you like, that you think has a great future, that you think will go up um, soon, you should wait for it to dip, for it to have a red day, and then add a position, slowly buy into it, okay? And when stocks are down and your position is down and your portfolio is red, you should not be upset that it's red. Instead, you should be happy. Try to change your psychology up. You should be happy that you can buy some more stock and in increase your position. That's what you want to be like. And that has helped me tremendously. Because many times your portfolio is only down for a short amount of time, um, especially with these big, big uh, market cap stocks. These stocks don't usually dip for a long time unless there's a big news. I mean, there's always an anomaly where, you know, this mar there's been a big, uh, there's been big news where this stock is going to go down for a long term. That's a different situation. But I'm saying generally in these market dips that happen, it's very normal and it's better for you to just in increase your position and just hold. Okay. And I found it very, very uh, for these big market cap stocks for you to just uh, never sell at a loss. This should not be happening. Okay. When you buy something like Facebook or Microsoft, there are very few situations where you would have to sell it at a loss. You should, if you want to get out of that position, you should be selling it when you break even or at a profit. There should be very little situations that these companies are much lower than your price for a long period of time, unless you bought at an all-time high because you FOMO. That's a different situation. I'm saying if you buy the dip, there should be very little situations where you have to sell a stock at a loss. Okay. And again, um, when I mentioned that you buy a stock and you hold on to it and when it dips, you try to in increase your position. This is called dollar cost average. You're lowering the average cost of your position, which is a great thing, okay? And when the stock price goes up, your profit increases. So this habit in and of itself has really helped me. So just to reiterate, when stocks go down, buy. When stocks go up, do not buy. All right, my next tip that I wanted to go over is the power of compound growth. Um, this is something that I think very people overlook. Uh, and it's the snowball effect. I'm sure many of you guys have heard this term in math class and whatnot. Um, so it's a snowball effect, right? It grows very slowly initially, but as time goes on, it really starts to add up and it grows very, very quick. And this is the mindset you wanna have. You wanna be in here for the long term. Okay. You don't want to be here for the short term, like, oh, you're just trying to, you know, double your money in a month. That's not what you want. You want to be here for the long term. And I promise you, it will help you and it'll grow very fast once you learn how the stock market works. So I'll share a quick personal experience of my account with you guys. Uh, when I started trading, like, uh, in, I think in March of 2020, when this crash was happening, I decided I had, you know, I had an account with $20,000. I remember it took me extremely long to go from $20,000 to $30,000. That 10K difference, it took me a very long time. And then from 30K to 40K, it also took me a pretty long time. But I remember as my account size started to grow from $40,000 to $50,000, it took maybe a month. And most recently growing from $60,000 to $70,000, it took me a week, less than a week. So it just comes to show you how easy it is to make money when you have money. I mean, it, it is true, right? And so what I tell everyone is focus on percentage growth. Try to focus on your skills and improving your skills. Don't focus on profit. Because if you're playing this for the long term, if you focus on your strategy and perfecting your, your skills and you focus on percentage growth, it will always be easier to come up with the capital. 
Okay. Once you know what you're doing in the stock market, you'll figure out a way to come up with the capital to increase your profitability. But the quick profits, all majority of the times have ended up in quick losses as well. And that's what you don't want. You want slow, steady, percentage wise growth. And an example, another example I love giving everyone is the penny example. So, I mean, I wanted to, um, yeah, you know what? Uh, well, I wanted to ask you guys this question. I'm not sure if you guys could type out the answer or not. I can't, I'm not sure. But if you had a penny doubled every single day, do you guys realize when it would hit a million dollars and how strong compound growth is? If you guys want, you can try to answer it in the um in the messages, let me let me see if anyone got it. Uh, yeah, so if you guys doubled a penny every single day, guess 30 days, someone said 30 days. Don't use a calculator, guys. Just double, guess how long it would take you to hit a million dollars. Okay, Muhammad Al Sayyid said 30 days. Any other Any other answers? Seven hundred days, okay. Thirty days and seven hundred days—that's a pretty big difference. What if six months, a year and a half? So if you doubled a penny every single day, it could take six months, one and a half years. I'm hearing seven hundred days to get to a million dollars. What if I told you it's less than all of that? It would take you twenty-eight days to have a one point three million dollars if you just started off with a penny. Think about that, guys. And the crazy part is, I think on day 20, you only have $5,000. So let me just go back to my presentation here. Yeah, so that's always an example that really drives it home for me. Focus on percentage growth, guys. It will definitely be more beneficial for you in the long term, much more than profit. The profit will come, I promise you. All right, so now let's go over common mistakes to avoid. And um, I've seen these mistakes happen. I've made these mistakes myself many, many times. I've also seen many people make these mistakes as well. So I'd say the biggest mistake is probably poor risk management. And um, this is because people come in with a wrong mindset. They wanna get rich overnight and they decide to put all their money into one trade, which is the opposite of what you guys should be doing. And they might even get lucky. So one or two trades, they might end up doubling their money. I've seen this happen, but long-term you will always end up burning your account. And I've seen that happen every single time. So generally there is a rule that um, you should never, you should know how much you're willing to lose before you go into a trade. And generally you shouldn't be losing more than two to 3% of your total account value on one trade. So let's say you have a hundred bucks, you go into a trade, you should not be losing more than $2 max on that trade. Okay. So that's the general rule, but regardless, you should know your loss limit. Don't put all of your cash into one trade ever. And over time, this will build your risk tolerance. It's like, it's like lifting weights at the gym, right? You know how you start off with 20 pound dumbbells. You keep doing it consistently over time. You can handle, you know, 30, 40 pound dumbbells. So what happens is, a lot of times when people have an account and it's down, they start to panic sell because, oh my God, they see their $500 account down hundred dollars. That's 20%. That's huge. And they just panic sell everything. And now they just took a 20% hit, right? This happens all the time. But over time, as you build your risk tolerance, you'll learn that you can handle when your account is lower and you don't get emotional and panic sell. You don't want to get emotional in these trades. If you think it's a good trade, your emotions should be out of it, okay? Maybe it is down 20%, but it comes back up. And as you build a cushion, this is when you should be taking larger risks, okay? You should never be taking larger risks when you just start off. As you build a cushion on your account, let's say your account's up 100% now, now you're able to take bigger risks. And the crazy part is once you're less emotional and you're able to take bigger risks because you know you have a safety net, you end up making a lot more money because of this either, because now you're, you're not constantly emotional and panic selling. Now you know that, Hey, you know, I took this bigger risk. It could be a big reward or a smaller risk. You should, your reward should always be greater than the risk you take always. Okay. in all the trades you take, but over time you can, you can build that risk tolerance when you have a cushion and you'll see that you can actually accelerate the amount of money you make. 
Another common mistake that I've seen many people make is that they give up too soon. This is very common. They, I've said this example over and over again. They get started. Uh, they put all their money into one stock. They do well. They do it a second time. They burn their whole account. And then they think, oh my God, this is just gambling. This is a scam. I can't do it. It's fake guys. And then they just quit. Okay. If you go into this with the long-term mindset, make just, okay, just try to convince yourself that you're in this for at least 90 days. Don't be the 90% that burns your account in three months. Okay. If you can convince yourself to be here in the long term, at least three months, just promise yourself you'll invest in learning and knowledge for three months. And you're not going to burn your whole account for just three months. If you can get over that hump and you'll start to just show up to the stock market every day and you start to notice patterns and you start to build an edge, you will be successful. I've seen this over and over again. You will learn something that works for you. Okay. And that's all you need. And of course, the last common mistake that I've seen everyone make is they just don't get started. It's the opposite of giving up too soon. They just never get started. They say that they want to, you know, they want to get into the stock market, but then this situation happens, that situation happens. Oh, the market's too overpriced right now. I can't go in right now. It's too expensive. Or maybe they're just scared of risking their money. The biggest, the biggest um, recommendation I have here is that you know, it's a famous quote, a journey of a thousand miles starts with just one step, guys. You got to get your feet wet and just dabble with the stock market with something that you're comfortable with. If this is your weakness that you're just scared of risking it and losing all of your money, then just start with like 50 bucks, something that you don't care about losing at all and just get comfortable being in the stock market. And remember, it's always better to time in the market. It's always better than timing the market. There, you will never be able to time the market correctly ever. There's actually studies that show that someone who is in the stock market consistently every single week, every single month, they'll just deposit a certain amount. And then someone who timed the market perfectly every single time in the long term, there's actually very little difference between the both of them. Okay. So as long as you're consistently in the stock market, let's say you just want to go the investor route and you just put in like 50 bucks every single week in the stock market, long term, long term, you will be fine. This whole time in the stock market, there are very little people. Actually, I don't think anyone can ever um, time the stock market perfectly ever. All right. That just doesn't happen. I think they refer to this as paralysis by analysis. You're overanalyzing. Just, you know, get your feet in there, get your feet in the water and just start investing. Just open a Robinhood account or whatever you want to start and just put in 50 bucks, 100 bucks, something you're comfortable with losing and just get comfortable with the format. Now, uh, speaking of Robinhood, so Robinhood is a platform that I use, but I actually have a few other ones as well. Um, so there's Robinhood. So these are all, the reason why I mentioned these three platforms is because all these have incentives for you to join. So Robinhood is giving out a free stock for everyone who's joining. Um, M1 Finance is giving $30 for whoever's joining. And then we have Webull who's giving out four free stocks for everyone joining. And again, this is worth at least $21. So Robinhood, I recommend for beginners, definitely. Their user inter interface is very nice. It's very easy to use. They've almost kind of made it like a game. There's a like confetti when you're profitable. It's kind of funny, but... Robinhood is a great app for beginners, very easy to use because I can see why the other investing apps can be intimidating. Um, it took me a while to learn all of the terms and all the different verbiage in those general um, investing apps. And Robinhood has done a fantastic job in simplifying it. All right. And there's some cool advantages to Robinhood too. Um, for example, you can buy fractional shares, which is amazing. So let's say you just want to dabble and throw in 50 bucks. You don't want to get too serious now. You want to learn to get comfortable with it. But you also want to buy Tesla. Now, Tesla's, I think, like right now, it's at $840 a share. What Robinhood allows you to do is you can buy 20 bucks of Tesla. They'll just give you a tiny fraction of it. So you can literally build your own portfolio buying huge tech stocks like Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft with just 50 bucks if you wanted to, theoretically. Right. So I think that's really helpful for Robinhood. It's a great place to start out. You can also buy cryptocurrency on Robinhood which you can't do on every um, trading platform. But keep in mind that cryptocurrency on Robinhood, you're not actually buying the crypto. Uh, they don't give you the actual coins and you know you can save it in your wallet. That's not how it works. It's just for buying and selling. So just keep that in mind. 
if you want to buy cryptocurrency for long term, I would definitely recommend Coinbase. Even though Robinhood is free, like there's no fees associated with buying Bitcoin, it is much safer for you to go to Coinbase and you know, pay the fees, but you get your Bitcoin in your own wallet and it's yours to keep. Okay. So I just wanted to put that disclaimer out there. And M1 Finance. Now, I personally have not used M1 Finance, but from what I hear, it's a great app. Like if you want to create your own fund, let's say you believe in Tesla, Microsoft, and Amazon, and you want to make a fund where you put in 50 bucks every week and that 50 bucks gets divided into all three of those companies every single week. So M1 Finance, I heard is great for that, where you can have like your own kind of fund and you just put like a hundred bucks or 50 bucks and it gets distributed evenly throughout that fund. So that's pretty cool. That's a pretty cool idea. Um, I personally don't use it though. And then Weeble, I do use Weeble. Um, I think they have a great incentive for free stocks for joining, which I think is amazing. And by the way, I'll give you guys my referral link. So if you guys uh, join using my link, then we both get free stocks. But yeah, overall, I think for beginners, Robinhood is probably the best one. Okay, so this is another question I see asked all the time. Should I buy Tesla and should I buy Bitcoin? So personally, myself, I know a lot of people, it's basically, um, they're fanboys on each side. Like you're either totally against Tesla, you think it's totally overvalued and it's totally unrealistic, or you're the opposite. You think Tesla is gonna do extremely well. I think they're perfectly priced. They have a lot of potential in the future. Personally, myself, I am a bull for EV. I think EV is going to be a huge market in the next decade. And Tesla is no exception. Now, I do agree that Tesla is extremely highly priced. But you also yeah. need to consider that yeah, Tesla can you, can you, is hold on, yeah. market and they're going to have a lot of potential because of that. You know, can you can you explain what EV is for those who don't know? Just break uh, it yes. uh, Yep, it's electric vehicle. EV yeah. is electric vehicle. So that's like your Tesla, your Neo, um, plug power, things like that. So Tesla, in my opinion, it is highly priced, but at the same time, we all need to keep in mind that Tesla has a lot of opportunity. They're going to be the first to market with many, many things. And not just that, because they're, they've been so early, they're also the company with the most data. And today, you guys all know data is worth more than anything, right? So Tesla might be the first with perfect autonomous driving. There's so much other potential. They got the semi trucks. They got all these different products coming out. And Neo is trying to do their best to catch up. Neo, for those that don't know, is a Chinese version of Tesla. They have their own, um, they, they're an EV company in China. They're predominantly focused more on SUVs, whereas Tesla is SUVs and sedans. And Neo actually just announced a sedan like a few weeks ago. And they have a little bit of a difference in how they use their batteries. And then Plug Power is another company that's been all over the news lately. I think they doubled in the last month. So Plug Power, they actually build fuel cells for electric machinery. And this is like your forklifts in Amazon. They have big customers like Amazon, um, Home Depot, Walmart. So Plug Power also has some huge customers. And I think they made an announcement recently that they're going to get into EV as well, electric vehicles. And that's why they've just jumped like crazy. So all three of these companies, they've jumped. I agree with that. And I think they are extremely valuable right now. But I also think they're going to continue to rise in their value, especially with the Biden administration. As you guys know that um, the Democrats and Biden administration are generally much uh, friendlier when it, when it comes to EV and clean energy. So I think they're gonna be a lot more incentives for these companies moving forward. And I think they're gonna do a lot better under the Biden administration. So what my technique is with these stocks is as they continue to rise, I just hold on to them. I rarely have been selling these stocks because they've just increased in value so much uh, lately. But when these stocks do dip, and sometimes they dip a little heavily, I try to increase my position in these. I try to buy a little bit of stocks and just hold on for long term. EV, I personally plan to hold on for long term. And I think that's worked very well for me. Um, <clears throat> now, what else? now, let's talk about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin's another one. So Bitcoin has gone on a crazy run this year, um, especially during the pandemic, just because People have been so unsure of the future of this economy and where things are going. So Bitcoin rose like crazy. I think in March of 2020, they were only at like $3,000 or something. It was crazy. And right now, for those that don't know, Bitcoin is right around uh, $36,000, I think. I think it hit $40,000 like a week or two ago. Now, personally, 
I did invest into Bitcoin. And although for many of you guys who might have invested in cryptocurrency in 2017, I know many of us are scarred <laughs> because of how everything crashed. I do think that Bitcoin is a little bit different this time around and a few reasons for this. So first of all, we're seeing a lot more um, institutional investors jumping into Bitcoin, which was not the case in 2017. All right. This is like big money, like the banks, institutional investors are getting into Bitcoin, which is a big deal. Uh, second, with all of these stimulus packages, I know, you know, we love those stimulus checks. It's nice, but it does come at a cost. And with all of us printing all of this money, and uh, I think Biden just announced another stimulus package of $1.9 trillion, right? It does come at a cost. And that cost is more money being printed and more money being printed means inflation. So inflation, um, for those that aren't aware, inflation means your money will be worth less as time goes on. And when that happens, many people tend to buy into other assets to hedge against inflation. It used to be gold. It still is gold for many, many people. But nowadays, you'll see a lot more people investing into Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. And for that reason, I personally am a bull for Bitcoin for this year. Uh, which means that I believe in Bitcoin. I think it's going to increase in price, especially after we release another stimulus package um, that I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, the stimulus package gets announced in February or March, we should get more stimulus checks. So I do think Bitcoin, at least in the short, short term, will go up because of in inflation. So that's my, that's my thoughts on Bitcoin. Now, I know there's Ethereum out there too, and there's a lot of other cryptocurrencies. I personally don't dabble in cryptocurrency too much anymore um, after 2017. But I do believe that uh, this year is different for Bitcoin. Now let's go over my stock predictions for 2021, okay? So as I've mentioned earlier, um, I think electric vehicle and energy stocks will continue to rise with the Biden administration uh, because not even, not just the fact that Biden won, but also the fact that Democrats are in control of the Senate, which means Democrats can, for those that don't know um, how the government actually works, if Democrats control uh, the Senate and the presidency and one more, I believe it's a house or something, they can basically get any big law they want passed. All right. They have majority in all three, which is a lot of power. And the agenda of many Democrats is cleaner energy and, you know, fight against global warming. So I, I would not be surprised if EV and energy continue to go up. Um, now, due to this reason also, I think Bitcoin will rise dramatically with inflation uh, due to the large stimulus bills. I think I read somewhere that 25, this is insane. So I think it was something like 25% of the money in the stock market today was just printed last year in 2020. So that's how much money we're printing, guys. So, I mean, eventually it will start to catch up with us. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. So in terms of inflation, Inflation can be good for the economy. Um, so when your money is less, when your money is worth less, that's called inflation. And inflation can be good for an economy if it's controlled. So the Fed, they try to control it to about 2% inflation every year. Now, because the US dollar has been so strong um, recently, probably the past decade, they have not hit the 2% inflation mark, which I guess is a good problem to have. So what the Fed is planning to do big picture here is that they don't mind our money um, having inflation because what they plan to do is just average that into like the past decade. So the past decade, the dollar um, barely had any inflation. Now for the next few years, we're going to have, we're going to see some inflation, but we're just going to average that into the decade and we should hit our target of 2% inflation every year. So, so inflation won't be all bad, but at the same time, I think it will um, cause Bitcoin to rise. Now, tech stocks. So my prediction for 2021 also with the Biden administration um, and these lower interest rates that many of you guys are probably aware of, we have historically low interest rates right now. And this does affect, you know, um, uh, purchasing debt or like asking for loans, especially for these companies, these huge businesses. And so cheap debt means that they can borrow money more and it increases them in profitability. And so I believe that and it's just not myself. I think a lot of large companies like JP Morgan and all of these companies, they've said that they believe tech stops are going to have huge blowout earnings this year uh, due to the low interest rates. And that's going to, you know, cause their prices to go up. So I personally believe in 2021, we're still going to see EV go up. We're still going to see tech stocks go up. 
and we're going to see energy go up and we're also going to see Bitcoin go up. All right. So again, I just wanted to put out that that is my personal opinion. I have my reasons for believing this way, but yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know that that is what I personally believe. All right, guys. Um, okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. All right. So uh, last portion of this presentation, guys, I wanted to go over, um, hold on. Financial goals in your 20s and 30s. I think this is really helpful. Um, I made a YouTube video on this and many people found this helpful. So I'm hoping I can do the same here. Uh, these are just things. Okay. As someone who's currently 28, um, these are things that I wish I knew in my 20s and uh, many things I did do in my 20s. And I'm very happy I did them without realizing that they were going to be big things when I was, you know, in my early 20s. And I think the, if you get to accomplish these goals in your 20s and 30s, I think you're, um, you're in a pretty good trajectory financially. So first of all, um, everyone should know where their money is going. You should be able to create a budget and you know where your money is going. And I think for this, mint.com is a great app. Now I'm not affiliated to them. I don't have a referral link to them or anything. I personally use mint.com. It's an app on my phone and it's amazing. What it does is you can link all of your credit cards to it, your bank accounts and everything. And it will basically track all of your expenses. Um, it can help you out where you're spending maybe too much money. You can create budgets on this app and you, Personally, you cannot improve your financial situation if you're not measuring it. And I think mint.com um, is a great and easy way, an automated way for you to get in control of your finances. So that's number one. Number one, you need to know where your money is going. Okay. Uh, number two is save your income. Um, this is something, of course, I wish uh, I did a bit of more of when I was younger. I did a pretty decent job, but you know, there's always room for improvement. And this is something when you're a little younger, you don't realize how important this can be. Try your best to save as much of your income as possible. Don't give in to lifestyle inflation. That's what they call it. So for those that don't know, lifestyle inflation is when you make a little bit more money and then your lifestyle increases um, almost the same amount so that you're not, it has not changed your financial situation at all. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're making $40,000. Uh, your expenses are, I don't know, $20,000 or $30,000, right? Now you got another job and they're paying you $60,000. And when you get this job, all of a sudden you got a nicer car, you got a nicer house because you need these things, which you don't really need them. And you start spending more on shopping. And then at the end of the day, you're saving just as much money as you were before, even though you got a twenty dollars or $30,000 raise, Right. So when you're younger, what I recommend is try to save as much of your income as possible. And the reason I say this is because you'll learn as you get older that the more money you have, the more opportunities it opens up for you to invest. And that's something that many people don't realize, okay? Um, another thing is stay away from debt. Now I know in today's day and age, many of you, many people are probably forced to get into student debt at least. And, you know, what you can't control, you can't control. If you have to go to like med school or college or whatever, you have a lot of student loans and student debt um, piled up. Okay, but make this a priority. Try to get rid of this as soon as you can. Because let me tell you something, as you get older, it only becomes harder and it becomes shackles. It becomes something that locks you in somewhere. So make it a priority to pay off debt as soon as you can, okay? And in terms of like credit card debt, like other than student loans, guys, if you're younger, you should try to you try your best to avoid any type of credit card debt. Credit cards should only be used as a tool uh, to get free stuff, man, like free perks, like traveling perks, stuff like that. You should not be using credit cards to buy stuff you don't need. And again, this is a very, very common phrase that a lot of people use, but it's true. A lot of times we buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't even care about with money we don't even have, right? So try your best not to do these things. These are common habits that many, many, many young people fall into. Uh, next is take risks. Um, this is something that I think everyone can work on. Your 20s is a time, and even your 30s is a time where you can take risks, okay? A lot of us have um, very little responsibility at this age. And if anything, as you get older, your, the amount of responsibilities only increases. So try to take as many risks as you can when you don't have too much to lose. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, you can afford to take these risks. Even society doesn't care. Like if you, you know, if you're in your 20s and you quit college and you start a business, and even if that business is a flop, look, you're in your 20s. You're expected to do this kind of stuff. You got a long time to figure it out. Okay. But just 
make educated decisions and learn to take risks, get out of your comfort zone. That's probably the biggest thing I, I can tell you. Now, I think every everything that I'm proud of myself for doing was because I took a risk at some point in the past. Okay, so try your best to take risks, guys. Get out of your comfort zone. Okay, so next is build your credit. Now, building your credit is um, extremely important in, in America. Uh, it gets you pretty nice perks, as I had mentioned in the past. And oh, yeah. You should be using these credit cards to assist you um, and, you know, just getting points. As I mentioned earlier, you get traveling points, you get gifts, you get rewards, a lot of cool things. And many things are based off of your credit score. So just uh, build your credit as early as you can and keep your credit score high. Use your credit card and pay it off 100% every month. You should not be paying interest in your credit cards. It's not good, guys. Financially, it's Financially, not good. Financially, it's not good. Now, um, the next point, start a retirement account. This is something that I personally have wished I had done earlier. So as I have mentioned previously in this presentation, compound growth is your friend, okay? And the earlier you start, the better. So I started a retirement account like mid-20s, but like if you have the opportunity and you have a job that has a 401k package and they literally give you free money, they're matching whatever you put into your 401k, then I highly recommend that you take it, okay? Because the earlier you start, the quicker it adds up when you get older. And, you know, there's a lot of tax benefits to having a 401k or an IRA. So I definitely, definitely recommend starting a retirement account, even though I know many young people are like, oh, you know, I'd rather spend that money right now. Trust me, you'll thank me to start some type of retirement account. And finally, for those um, who perhaps are not working right now, I know I think there's some teenagers here as well. Uh, develop a high income skill. If you want to do well financially, you need to develop some type of high income skill, whether it's in STEM or health or whatever, just develop a high income skill. I see many times that, you know, people only follow their passion, which is good, follow your passion, but they, they totally um, forget about the financial aspect of it. And you should be, uh, you should be trying to develop a skill, especially if you're paying for college, you should be developing a skill that you can actually have an ROI a return on investment on something that you can earn income where you can pay off your college debt and everything okay so make sure you don't forget about whatever skills you're trying to develop in your free time you know um, uh, taking courses or if you're going to college make sure it's a, you can actually create a high income with and with that being said guys that is it i got my referral links here and you know i can probably send this out i'll work with Zuffer on that Go ahead, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on Instagram, The Iconic Show. Um, I also gave my LinkedIn information. And then from here, we can go and do a quick Q&A, Zafar. So again, this is all about your preference. What, uh, what my mentor uh, traded were uh, big, cap, big cap tech stocks, okay? And that's what I've primarily been trading and that's worked well for me. I, I look at stocks, again, I can send this list out if, um, you know, if you guys request it. I can, send it. I can send out the stocks that I follow. Usually they gotta be big cap, they gotta be the big names, um, like the names that we've all heard of. And there needs to be some type of volatility where you, know, you see, if you look back uh, six months to a year, you see the stock going up and down because us as traders, we make money off of the ups and down movement, okay? Uh, if you want to get into the technicals, I believe there is a bit of a, um, a ratio of float uh, to market value. So float is the number of shares available. And then there, there's a bit of a ratio how you can find out which stocks are going to be volatile or not. But generally, I just follow the big names that I see go up and down a lot. Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, hold on. Okay. Okay. So that's a great question. So in terms of swing trading, I understand that you will hit more capital gains tax. Um, so capital gains tax, for those that aren't aware, if you hold, buy and hold an investment for over a year, you pay, I think it's like uh, 10 or 15. It's a, it's a much lower percentage of, of tax that you'd pay. Whereas if you buy an asset and sell it within a year, you pay a much higher tax rate. So personally, um, in terms of last year, I did pretty well last year, but last year was more of an experimental year for me. So what I did, I just added it to my income. So I am going to be taxed more heavily on it. But I've spoken to my accountants now for this year. Uh, you can set up something like an S-Corp, which there are many, many tax benefits if you set it up as a business or a corporation. 
and it will help you and allow you to save a lot more money on taxes. So although I am swing trading, I'm getting taxed heavily, I can kind of offset that by creating an, a corporation. Okay. So personally, myself, I am investing more in Bitcoin because if I feel like it's kind of a hedge um, as tech, uh, tech stocks drop, uh, I believe if the stock market does crash with the Biden administration, we would see Bitcoin going up. So that's one reason why I'm investing a bit more heavily in Bitcoin right now. Also, um, there is a such thing as recovery stocks, and these are all the airlines, the hotels, the cruises. I personally have not studied them enough to know. Um, but yes, I mean, from what I've heard, uh, the recovery stocks are great places to invest your money into because as the stimulus bill comes up and Biden administration, they're going to be focusing on economic recovery. A lot of those stocks, there's still a lot of room um, to gain profit in. Maybe not a uh, quick term, maybe not in the next month or so, but if you bought and held a lot of those recovery stocks like Delta Airlines, American Airlines, a lot of those airlines that are really, really heavily down, I think you can make some decent profit in the next year. Okay. So dollar cost average is, let's say um, I have 50 bucks, okay? And Tesla is at 10 bucks today. Dollar cost average is you don't put all 50 bucks into Tesla all at once because there's a lot more risk associated with that. So what if tomorrow Tesla, instead of $10, it's at $5, right? Or what if instead of um, $5, it's at $8? Or instead of $10, it goes up to 12 or 13. So what dollar cost average means is that you buy a little bit of it in portions and small segments over time. So instead of putting all 50 bucks into a $10 share of Tesla that same day, I'll buy, it, I'll buy maybe 10 bucks worth that day the next day I'll buy maybe another 10 bucks worth. Maybe Tesla is a little lower, it's at $8. And then I do that for five days and I buy Tesla over five days instead of just one. What this does is that it decreases your risk dramatically, okay? So let's say you bought a stock and you ended up buying it at a peak and then it drops right after that. And this could always happen. The stock market, no one will ever be able to predict what happens in the stock market. A lot of it is just estimated get like uh, being hypothetical in what you're in your approach and then your risk management. You need to be able to manage your risk. So if you see a stock going down, so if you dollar cost average, you're basically limiting your risk. You're buying it over time, which is a lot less riskier. You might decrease your profit by a little bit, but you're also dramatically lowering your risk. In terms of that, uh, I mentioned that Bitcoin I'm investing in. I feel like a lot of institutional investors there. I hear a lot about Ethereum too. I personally have not done my research in uh, the altcoins, not since 2017. Um, so I wouldn't be able to answer that. Okay. Does Yes, it does. <laughs> SPACs, man. SPACs are great. So for those that don't know, SPACs is... Um, a special purpose acquisition company. Uh, what this means is, okay, so the traditional way of companies getting onto the stock market is called the IPO process, right? So companies go through this huge long process. It takes six months to a year or maybe years, actually. I'm not exactly sure how long the process takes. I just know it, it's a very hard process and it's very long. So an alternative method to that is that there are companies on the stock market whose sole purpose is to merge with another company within two years. And so if you're a company that is, ha that is proven, you guys have the technology, you have the sales, you have money, you can afford this. What companies do is instead of going through the IPO process, they bypass the process and they just merge with the company that's already on the stock market. And that's basically an easy way to get onto the stock market. And those companies that they merge with, those blank companies that don't really have a product or anything and their purpose is just to merge, those companies that are called SPACs. Now, I guess the brother brings up or sister brings up SPACs because they've been really popular lately. Um, if you get into a SPAC before it actually merges, they will double um, or even triple or sometimes more once the merger has taken place. Now, personally, I've done well with EV SPACs. I've done SPACs that only focus on electric vehicles like um, uh, what was the most I did XL. XL Fleet was a good one that I bought. Uh, there's GIK. Um, so yeah, I mean, SPACs are newer. It's a good way to make money. But again, I only took these risks when my account had already doubled. I had a cushion to play around with and I took a pretty big risk on a SPAC and I did very well. Now, I wouldn't personally say to um, just play with SPACs, make that your only, uh, only um, trading method. But again, if it works for people, it works for people.
But that's basically what a SPAC is. I personally, um, I like them, but I'm not too heavy on them either. Not right now. Right. Um, ETF, um, a stock, one stock is basically uh, one company, right? So if you buy a share of Tesla, you're buying one share of Tesla. An ETF is basically a fund. I believe it's an um, exchange traded fund. That's what an ETF stands for. It's basically a fund of many, many different stocks. So the point of this is, is that it lowers your um, it lowers your risk factor and then gives you exposure to many different things at once. So I guess the most famous example of this is the S and P 500, which many of you guys might have heard of. They have an ETF called Spy, and so what Spy tracks is like the 500 biggest uh, companies in the U.S. Right. So that's what an ETF is. It's basically just a fund of many, many different companies, just small portions of them. Okay. Uh I've been asked this many times. I have not done this yet. I don't do this right now, but um, maybe in the future, I'll think about it. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, Jabari. Uh, so brother, and um, thank you for thank doing you this, time. first of all. Thank you so um, much. So the, the thing I wanted to ask, uh, I'm new to this, and I'm actually in this for the long term. Mm -hmm. So I, I understand, I was following how you said that you, you encourage people to buy when the market is down yes. and you know hold on to it when the market is up, right? Mm -hmm. so, so my question is, for example, I buy a share for $2, right? Yep. And the next day it goes up to $5. I'm at a profit. Yep. But, the, but in the following coming days, it falls, but it doesn't fall below the initial cost that I bought it for, right? Mm -hmm. So what what should I do at that point? Should I wait for it to see if it goes down more? Or mm -hmm. if I can take that risk, I should buy it at a lower price, which is mm -hmm. still higher than my initial cost. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, no. So I, I have it. a lot of conflict with that thought. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. Now, a lot of this comes down to intuition that you build over time. So one of the biggest factors for me personally is how fast did it go to the five dollars, right? If it go, if it went to the five bucks really fast and then dropped down to you know three fifty the next day, I might buy some more because I think it might just shoot back up again. Um, but it it always it never hurts to buy some. Just don't go overboard. Or if it drops down really quickly, I might wait a day for for it to see if it goes below my two dollars. So a lot of it you learn by watching the stocks. Uh, over a period of time and you learn what's normal for these stocks and what isn't and you know if it's growing too quick or if it's dropping too fast based off of that you, you get a sense of if it would be a good time to buy or not i know it sounds really abstract right now but it's like it, I, I there's no every scenario is different that's what i'm trying to get at got it thank you i i have a question too do you recommend any uh, predict prediction websites like Zacks or something to really rely on whether the stock will move up or down? Mm, now those are good. Here's my thing with these. So I used to read a lot of these when I was near to trading, but over time I realized majority of this stuff, it's just everyone's guess at the end of the day. There's still analysts out there that say Tesla is going to go to $40, right? And these are like literally like financial analysts. This is their job. They get paid big bucks to do this. And I think it's always helpful to read these articles, to look at different opinions and why people think the way that they think. Maybe they'll have some good information on why they predict these prices are going to go down or why they're going to go up. But at the end of the day, keep in mind that you should be taking these articles with a grain of salt because at the end of the day, no one knows for sure. Like I've seen um, situations where, oh, they said, you know, Neo Day is next week. It's going to go crazy. And then boom, it actually drops like 20% because all the people that are in there for a while, they're taking profits. So at the end of the day, it's everyone's guess. But I definitely recommend reading these articles to get an insight as to why these people are thinking what they're thinking. I have one more follow-up question, if you don't mind. Now, someone told me, you know, when to get entry into a stock, but mm -hmm. more important is when to exit the stock. Mm -hmm. So that's like some people go with the rule of like, if I make 25%, 30%, I am done. I am out of it. Yeah. Some people might go, Oh, I want hundred percent return. Mm -hmm. So it's like, where do you set the limit? Or I'm like, when to exit out, it's, it's more important. Right. So can you shed some light on that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good question. So personally, I believe 
that it's not where you sell, it's where you buy. That's where you make your money. The cheaper, the better discount you get on the buying price, that's actually where you buy your money. That's where you make your profit. And then the same can be said about other assets too, like housing and stuff like that. But you bring up a good point about selling and when to sell. And this is actually a very tough decision and it depends what kind of trading you're doing. So if you're day trading, many times people will have a certain percentage where they'll say, hey, if I'm up two or 3% for the day, I'm out, that's all I need. I don't wanna get greedy. Now me personally, what I do is similar to dollar cost average, but you can call this like selling average. So what I do is if a stock goes up really fast, really quick, I might sell a small portion of it just to capture some profit. And then over time, as it continues to go up, I just take more and more profit. And then when I think that, you know, it hit a high or maybe it starts to drop again, I just sell all of it all. So I sell it in phases, just like how I buy it in phases. And this way, you might not be having the greatest profit you could have had, but you're dramatically lowering the risk. Exactly. Thank you. You're welcome. Just a quick question. Actually, two questions, if that's okay. Um, the, the first one is with regards to um, taxes on, on capital gains. So you explain how um, you, the taxes on capital gains work. So just to kind of reiterate, it's if you bought a stock at $10 and now it's $20, you, you cash out, you pay your capital gains on $10. And, you know, depending on how long you've held that stock for, mm -hmm. you could either pay a particular rate if it's less than a year or more than a year. But say, for example, I, I, bought a stock at $10 and I was $20, but now that $20, I use that $20 to buy another stock, which then makes $5. And now I use that 25 to make, you know, and make the problem a little bit more complex. Yeah. How do capital gains work in that case? So it's still the same thing. So if you, if that stock goes from $10 to $20, you're still selling that stock, right? And you make that $10 profit. That's going to be, cap that's going to be capital gains because you did that over short term. And then you're using that small $10 profit and adding, and you just using it to buy another stock. And then you're making, and then you're selling that stock to make that other five dollar profit. So again, it's going to be based off of how quickly you buy and sell. Does okay. that clarify it? I, I think it does. So, so ultimately, anything outside that ten dollars is capital gains. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then the second question I had was, you you made mention of um, like being able to um, um, use work the market, not work the market, but I guess work the market. I guess would be a good place to use it, not as an individual as a company in such a way that you can maximize or minimize actually the amount of taxes that you use. Could you, could you put some more, could you say some more words on that? Wait, like sorry, you talk, can you repeat the question? I kind of missed it. Sorry. Yeah. No, so you, you, you spoke about like being able to, um, um, to, to trade stocks, invest and reinvest stocks, but to do it in such a way that you aren't being represented as an individual, but as a company. Yes. Um, and it has its benefits to it where, you know, as a, as a company, you'd usually, you know, you may pay less in taxes. Could you put some more words on that? Yeah. Just... Yeah. So um, my accountant had mentioned that I uh, set uh, my stock portfolio as an S corp and basically as a corporation, as a business, all of the profits go to the business. And as a business, I'm allowed to write off many, many expenses. Um, for example, uh, I, I don't know, anything related to the business, I can write it off as an expense. And that's a huge benefit because now you're getting taxed after, uh, what was it? No, before, you're getting taxed after you've made all of your income instead of before you've actually gotten your income, which is, there's a lot of benefits to this. So tax write-offs, this is a huge benefit of setting up your businesses as corporations. Thank you so much. If you don't mind, may I ask one, one last question? With regards to the accountant part, how does an individual have an accountant? Um, is that something that happens or do you have to always be a company? How do you how do you form a relationship with an accountant? Is it like going out to look for an accountant? Yeah, what would be yeah. some of the ways that you would recommend that individuals learn how to yeah, follow so, that? So personally myself, when I had a, a when I had a sock business I mentioned way back then, it was a business and I needed an accountant to file my taxes. I built a great relationship with actually a tax guy that I met at ISNA in Texas. And he was actually a really, really nice guy. And he helped me out a lot. And so this brother, he's actually from the Northeast, but I guess he just happened to be in Texas for ISNA that weekend too. So I met him there. And since then we've had a great relationship. And whenever I have a quick tax question, I just um, contact him. But what I would do in everyone's situation is um, if you're first experiment with Robinhood, because it's a pain in the butt getting into accounting and you know um, filing your taxes that way, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Sometimes it might not be worth it. What I would say is start off Robinhood investing without all of that stuff. Just experiment with it for a year, get successful at it. And once you see you're consistently making money, 
then I think that's when you take a bigger step and you try to find an accountant, you build a relationship with them, you contact them and you let them know your situation and they'll give you all the different options you have. And then I think that's when you should invest your time in setting up a corporation and, um, and, you know, keeping track of all of your expenses related to the business and creating write-offs and all of that. It might not be worth it at once until you get, uh, until you've got some success in trading stocks. Good question, uh, brother. Nam. Um, so I have Robinhood account, uh, converting that individual account into corp account. Do I have to open up a separate account or can this be converted? Okay. That's a great question. I'm actually going through this process right now. So last year, like I mentioned, was an experimental year and I just set it all up as personal. This year um, I've worked, I'm working with the accountant. And so <clears throat> what I think is going to end up happening is I have to create another account. And then I think you could transfer all of your stocks uh, via Robinhood to a different account. So you don't have to sell and buy it all over again. So I think that's what's going to end up happening, but I, I don't know yet. I'm still going to. But that, that takes almost a week to transfer all those stocks to that. So that, that's where you now. shut down for a week, right? Yeah, take a break. <laughs> well, Bitcoin is moving too much, so it can't take a break right now. <laughs> well, okay. So the Bitcoin thing, man, you need a strong stomach for that. Sometimes it's down five, ten thousand 10,000 in like a night. You just need a strong stomach. So what I'm thinking in terms of myself, what I try to tell myself to stay sane is that hold it at least until um, we get the stimulus checks out and yeah. see how it reacts, right? Because there's going to be a lot of inflation and there's going to be a lot of money printed again. So at least I'm going to hold it until then and see where it's at then. If I'm up, then I'll hold it longer. If not, if I'm, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty stable and I feel like I can make more money somewhere else, I'll, I might take the money out. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing mostly like a day trading on a bit, Bitcoin with the Robinhood. As you mentioned, it's not really you're holding, you, you don't have a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of trying to make money every day with the, with the spike and when it goes down. Yeah, what I recommend, which you probably already know, just use limit orders with Bitcoin on Robinhood. Because I've noticed that if you don't use limit orders and you just do a market order, they execute extremely poorly on Robinhood. Like you might see it at 35500 but it executes at like 35900 or something. Yeah, and the good thing about Robinhood, if I don't know if you, you mentioned that or not for people, I mean, you can do it after hours trade too in it. You can do anytime you want. Yep. Um, okay, th thanks a lot. Um, just to give everyone else a chance, are there any other questions? Yeah, brother, and I'm, uh, how about short selling? Sorry, what was that? How about what? Short selling. Short selling. Okay, brother, you sound like them. So there is a lot of discussion on that, on whether or not that's permissible or impermissible. I'll be honest with you guys, man. I, I just try to be conservative. I don't, I don't short sell and I don't do options. Okay. I know there's a lot of opportunity there, but Alhamdulillah, I mean, I'm doing solid, uh, just buying and selling stocks. So I don't short sell. For those that don't know, short selling is when you're, when you think a stock is going to go down. So let's say Tesla's at 500 now. I think next week it's going to go at 300. So I can short the stock and make money on the way down. And how this works is, uh, many people might not know how this works. It's basically, okay, so I have a container of yogurt, okay? Well, actually, no, I don't have a container of yogurt. Let's say Zuffer wants a container of yogurt. And I tell Zuffer, look, Zuffer, I'll give you a container of yogurt for three bucks. I'll sell it to you. And he's like, okay, because he really needs that yogurt. Now, I go to my neighbor. I don't have any yogurt. I go to my neighbor. I'm like, yo, uh, can you just let me borrow the uh, container of yogurt from you? Um, for three bucks. And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So he gives me that container of yogurt. I sell it to Zuffer for three bucks, right? And so Zuffer is happy. He got his yogurt. I got three bucks. Now my neighbor's still unhappy because I still owe him a container of yogurt. So I knew that, let's say, you know, a container of yogurt, the prices are going to go down next week. It's going to go down to $1. Now I just go to the grocery store. I buy a container of yogurt for a dollar and I give it to my neighbor. So I made $3 selling it to Zuffer. And then I made a dollar um, giving it back to my neighbor. So I've made $2 profit, right? I sold it to someone without having it. And then I paid back the person I borrowed from. That's how short selling works. So a lot of, I, I mean, I've, let, I've read a lot of discussions saying that, you know, you shouldn't be selling stuff you don't own per se. And I, I get that. I get that. And just, I personally try to stay away. Thank you. Next question. Yeah. Any other questions? Like, I, have, I have one more quick question was, SPAC, okay. So whenever the, whenever the, oh, for example, uh, Airbnb went IPO like last month, you could never get at the, st at the starting price. The moment it starts up, it starts skyrocket and went all the way. Like, you know, yeah, is yeah, there yeah. a way to catch it early somewhere? Yeah. Is oh, there yeah. Actually, I definitely recommend you go on my YouTube channel and I actually made a video on this, 
how to buy Airbnb IPO stock before everyone else on Robinhood. So this wasn't a SPAC, by the way, this was an IPO. So what Airbnb, what you can do on Robinhood, you're not going to get at the IPO price. You're not going to, I, by the time it gets to Robinhood, the price is going to be increased a lot more. But what you could do is you could beat all the Robinhood investors to it. So how you do this is you set a limit order and you times the IPO price, because I'm saying this based off of my previous knowledge, I've seen this happen. So let's say the IPO price was at like 70 bucks. I put my limit order at like $200. So anything underneath that, if Airbnb starts up on Robinhood at a lower price than that, it will execute. So I'll be, it will execute automatically. So I'll get the price of that stock before all the other Robinhood investors, you know, type it in and try to place a market order. I'll already be in there. So that's a way you can beat Robinhood investors. That's what I did. Oh, that's a great point. Thank you. There's hey, a... uh, and, um, I had a, a quick question for you. Thank you, first of all, for doing this. It's so helpful. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, like for Tesla, for example, um, we see all these financial parameters like the P.E. ratio and, you know, all the all the highs and lows that it hits um, in a 52, 52 week mark. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, it seems like investors kind of go on their own hunch about the value, what the value of the stock is. <coughs> So I just wonder if like the speculation of investors um, impacts the value of a stock more sometimes or, uh, than the actual fa financial parameters. And how do you how do you gauge that with the stock? Um, do you go more by the financial parameters of a stock? And is Tesla just sort of an outlier? Um, you know, how, how do you go about that? So I, I pay attention to financials more if I'm value investing. Um, and there are many times where I'd go like I'd give a lot more attention to the speculation. Now, in terms of Tesla, Tesla was considered a special breed before, but I think now a lot more of these large institutions are trying, are trying to believe in Tesla. And the main reason is this, you can't go off the PE ratio. There's a lot of um, Tesla, a lot of the valuation in Tesla and these other EV companies is the future and what their, what their future potential is. Like Tesla has so many other things that they're gonna be doing. They have the solar panels that they haven't done yet but they're working on it. They have autonomous driving, which could be approved anytime soon. Um, they have a Giga Berlin factory. They have many factories they're building all the time. They have a semi truck um, project they're working on, which can literally change the industry of truck drivers in America, which is one of the high, what the most popular job in America in like 30 different states. So there are just so many different um, future potentials for Tesla. And the thing is that recently they've been converting into everything they're saying. So I think institutions are trying to, are starting to believe that and they're like, holy crap, if these guys actually do everything they're saying, there is enormous opportunity out there for them. And because they're the first to market, it's going to take years for everyone else to catch up. They said the closest rival to Tesla right now is like five or six years behind. So that's, I think that's one of the reasons that explains Tesla's crazy evaluation. Now, it's just uh, the price just keeps going up. I mean, I'm not sure what else to say. I'm sure there's some speculation tied up in there. But the fact of the matter is people thought Tesla was overpriced before it even hit like four hundred dollars before the split right now if you think about it before the split it's at like 800 times five it's at four thousand dollars a share it's i mean i think that that's my thought process of it and i was going to ask how should we distribute our savings between things such as index funds and um actual direct investment into the stock market like robin hood mm -hmm. Uh, I think for everyone, it's an individual preference and how they want to set it up and what they're comfortable um, with in terms of risk. So me personally, I have a 401k at work and then I have a small account separately. That's what I do for a lot of my long-term positions. And then the majority of my account is my Robinhood account where I do um, trading. That's where I trade. Now, again, it's up to your preference. If you're new to trading, what I'd recommend is you start with a smaller portfolio and just get comfortable with it. And once you get profitable, then I would definitely recommend um, increasing the size. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for. Uh... I just want to say thank you, uh, Zafar, and everyone else for you know um, giving me your time. Hope you guys appreciated this um, this presentation, and I actually had a lot of fun. As you guys can tell, I have a lot of passion when talking about this. I don't really get bored of it, so I hope you guys enjoyed it.